It's now my privilege to warmly welcome our speaker for this evening, Dr. Valerie Karras. Dr. Karras is Assistant Professor of Church History at the Perkins School of Theology at Southern Methodist University. She's also served as a research associate at the Thesaurus Lingue Greche, an online digital Greek library based at the University of California, Irvine. She has been Assistant Professor of Greek Patristics in the Department of Theological Studies at St. Louis University, a fellow in residence and later professor at Hellenic College and Holy Cross Greek Orthodox School of Theology. She's also been an adjunct lecturer in the Department of Classics and Religious Studies at Washington University in St. Louis. She has earned doctorates in patristic theology at the Aristotelian University at Thessaloniki and in church history from the Catholic University of America in Washington, D.C. She also holds a Master of Theological Studies degree from Holy Cross Greek Orthodox School of Theology. Dr. Karras' areas of research include women in early and Byzantine Christianity, gender in early church theology and Orthodox Christianity, in ecumenical and interreligious and feminist conversations. She's published articles and translations and book reviews in scholarly journals such as Church History, the Journal of Early Christian Studies, and Theological Studies, and in such books as the Cambridge Companion to Feminist Theology and the Holy Women of Byzantium. She's now completing revisions on her first book, Women in the Byzantine Liturgy, which will be published by Oxford University Press. She's been invited widely to lecture, presented papers at numerous conferences and academic gatherings. Also, her avocation is music. She holds a diploma in Byzantine music from Greece and has served as a chanter, choir director, and organist at various Orthodox parishes. We look tonight, we look forward to a lively, a stimulating, and thought-provoking lecture this evening. So please join me in warmly welcoming Dr. Valerie Karras. What I'm going to talk to you about this evening is a little bit of the research that I have done that will be um, published in the book uh, Women in the Byzantine Liturgy, um, specifically to discuss some of the consecrated and ordained women's roles um, in this period of the early church and the Byzantine church. Um, too often, we have the mistaken idea today, I think, as Eastern Christians, that nothing has ever changed for us. So whatever women do or don't do today is what they have or haven't done for 2,000 years of Christian history. Um, my own research shows that nothing could be further from the truth. Um, can we have the first slide? So I just wanted to show you, most of you <laughs> should be aware of... Um, the extent of the Byzantine Empire, this is more or less at its height. Um, most of what I'm going to be dealing with will, however, for today be with Constantinople, um, if you can see that right over here, and um, also Jerusalem. And then there will be bits and pieces from other places such as Antioch and Alexandria. Now, when you look at what women did and did not do liturgically in the church in earlier periods, it's important to recognize that this is not abstract. Liturgical participation, the roles that men and women have played, is not some sort of abstract concept, but rather that a number of factors filter in to determine what types of roles men and women have had in the church. So with respect to women... Social and cultural issues are extremely important. The idea of seclusion and segregation of women from men was very strong in the late antique period and in the Byzantine Empire. And because of this, you'll see that it both limits what women can do and it also provided opportunities um, for women that w would not have been there perhaps otherwise. Um, the same is true with respect to the sexual division of functions and roles. There was a very strong sense in the, in the antique world that men's sphere of influence and function was the public sphere, 
and that women were limited to the private sphere, to the home. And so what you see with respect to women's liturgical participation and the types of um, liturgical functions they have is that it largely mirrors these kinds of divisions of catering to women who are segregated from men and also um, a more restricted role that is geared toward women in the home. There are also theological issues that come into play. There is a division between the churches of Antioch and Alexandria in the early period regarding the idea of, of ritual impurity with respect to menstruation and childbirth. The Church of Antioch did not have any such notion. It fought very strongly against this. We see this in some early church orders. We also see it in some of the sermons of St. John Chrysostom, that as Christians we are no longer under the Levitical law, and therefore those ideas of ritual impurity that would lead to restricted liturgical roles and functions did not apply. However, the Church of Alexandria was very different, and you find, in fact, bishops of the Church of Alexandria saying that women um, should not even enter the church, much less receive the Eucharist when they're menstruating. And so you see that um, the Church of Alexandria does not have deaconesses, for instance, to the same extent as the Church of Antioch and of Constantinople. The, however, the this notion of ritual impurity that you do see in the Church of Alexandria does make its way into the Byzantine Church, into the Church of Constantinople later on through a council which incorporates some of these canons that, uh, canonical letters, really private letters that were written by these Alexandrian bishops, excuse me. And so, it will play a role later and, in fact, seems to play a role in the demise of the female diaconate around the end of the 12th century. Um, another issue, and this is a very important one even to the present day, is the question of theological anthropology. When I say theological anthropology, I'm not talking about anthropology as a social science, but rather the idea of who we are as human beings, as men and women created in the image of God, and what does that mean about us at a theological level. One of the issues that comes into play here is what is normative for us as human beings, as men and women who are part of the body of Christ? Do we find normative the state of humanity before the fall, that's prelapsarian. Do we make normative the state of humanity after the fall, that's postlapsarian? And even there, there's a second question, which is, do we mean postlapsarian before Christ, which would then bring in all of that Levitical impurity uh, material, or after Christ? Or finally, do we make really normative our eschatological understanding of who we are as men and women. For instance, monasticism is really a forward view, an eschatologically oriented lifestyle. Finally, there's the pastoral issue, which is the need to minister to the women faithful in these various Christian communities and to minister to them, taking into account the social and cultural aspects that the church is dealing with because although the church is not of the world, the church is very clearly in the world and has to take that into account. What I'm going to talk about this evening are some various roles and orders that women had liturgically. The first is not even an actual order. It's just a function, a role that we see some um, noble women having in the uh, Middle Byzantine period. These are women that I call processional incense bearers. But then you have a number of orders of women who are consecrated but not ordained, and they do have certain liturgical functions at various times in the church's history. So we have nuns and virgins, we have consecrated widows, and we have a group called the Grapte, which I'm going to um, discuss in, in a few minutes. Uh, these are a group of women who functioned 
associated with actually a male monastery in um, Constantinople. And then finally, we have a couple of ordained orders of women. And with the myrrh bearers, we don't know for certain whether or not they're ordained, and I'll talk about that later when I discuss them, but my suspicion is that they probably were. Um, with respect to female deacons, they very clearly were ordained. We have the ordination rites um, in a number of prayer books and manuscripts, and they were um, the same order and level as male deacons. Now, this first group that I mentioned just shows how women could function liturgically on an informal ad hoc basis. These women, and you can see these three women with the headdresses and the scarves around their heads, um, they're holding pyxes or um, some type of caskets. Here, um, you can see these. This fresco is from a women's monastery from the Panagia of Latemnitisa in Arta in northern Greece. And the, the fresco and the monastery were commissioned and funded by, um, a very wealthy woman, one of the Paleologinas, one of the Paleologus family, um, who in fact, she and her daughter had been imprisoned for a period of time because of their refusal to support the um, the forced union from the Second Council of Lyon, the union between the Byzantine Church and and uh, the Church of Rome, and so after they they were released, they founded this monastery and supported it. Um, what the larger fresco, which I have not shown here, depicts is a weekly procession that was held in Constantinople with the Palladium, the um, the uh, sort of, um, uh, what's another word for palladium, let me think, um, the, the triumph of the city, the protection of the city, which was um, the icon of the Theotokos. Um, and these women in this larger scene have a very prominent place in the front. And as I, as you can see here, are carrying something that must have been a part of the service. It seems clear because they also participated in the council that formally abolished um, the union, it seems pretty clear that these women were given this particular function and role because of their um, support for the Byzantine church and their refusal to um, give in to the union um, from the Second Council of Lyon that had been done unilaterally by the Byzantine emperor without the consent of the larger church. Now, nuns and virgins, virgins are something that we find from very early on in the church. Monasticism starts to take root as a more formal order in the fourth century. But you have virgins from very early on. Um, even St. Paul um, discusses this. And you see in some of the early church orders, for instance, Hippolytus's apostolic tradition, that they are recognized as a distinct group um, they're consecrated, um, and you see that they actually have a liturgical role. They chanted at the Agape meal, and they were commemorated as a specific group in the prayers um, of the church. You also see that in the apostolic constitutions, which dates to the 4th century, they receive special seating in the church, or I don't know if seating is exactly the right word since there weren't really pews, but <laughs> they have a special place um, in the front of the women's section of the church. The men and women were in separate parts of the church. This is part of the segregation, social segregation, that was common then. And they were the first to receive the Eucharist among the women. Um, now you see with the nuns, as, as nuns develop, as uh, monastic orders develop from the 4th century on, you see that nuns have various types of roles. Occasionally, you find them, as in Thessaloniki, according to um, a document called the Timarion, a, a, a kind of um, um, travelogue, you find them actually chanting in um, in the church of St. Demetrius, and they're actually described as chanting in the same place where um, in the church of Hagia Sophia, the great church of, of St. Sophia in Constantinople 
you find um, the deaconesses chanting. So there seems to be some sort of connection there. But most of their activity, of course, is within the monastery itself. Excuse me. And because of this idea of seclusion of the nuns and of the monks, this idea of avaton, um, nuns in monasteries did much more liturgically than most women would do in a parish setting. So you see them chanting some of the, of course they're chanting all the services and doing some of the services themselves. Some of the, the lesser hours were um, actually um, celebrated within the dormitories, for instance, according to the tipica, the, the um, rule or order of, of various uh, women's monasteries. And you see them serving acolyte-type functions, um, assisting the priest at the liturgy that was held in the women's monasteries. Now, consecrated widows um, should be distinguished from generics, the social category of widows, women whose husbands have died. These are women whose husbands had died, but they were specially enrolled, and we see them already discussed in the New Testament. The Apostle Paul makes mention of them, and we actually see them discussed as an order in um, in uh, 2 Timothy. So we have evidence of these consecrated widows from apostolic times to the 5th century. Now, they do appear to have been consecrated in almost all cases as opposed to being ordained. The one um, exception to that is a 4th to 5th century document known as the Testamentum Domini, where you actually see them described, there's an ordination rite, and they they actually seem to be the equivalent of um, female deacons in most of the other ordination rites. It's an interesting document because deaconesses are also mentioned in it, female deacons, but they appear to be part of the minor orders in that particular community, whereas the um, the widows are the equivalent of the male deacons, and you can see that um, both in terms of the ordination rite and in terms of where they stand during the consecration. They're in the altar area. Well, all of the clergy are, but their um, positioning is equivalent to the male deacons there. Now, they were to be at least 60 years of age. There was a very strong sense, you see this with both the widows and you see it also with the female deacons, that um, these women could not be married nor could they remarry after they were ordained or consecrated. So part of um, assuring that was to have them be older. So 60 years of age was the minimum, and they could only have been married once. They were to be a very good repute. And this is because of their position in the church as, um, one might say, a type of social worker, really, uh, a combination of... Um, of nun and social worker in a sense because they did some of the social work aspects of counseling the women in the community, taking care of their various needs. They also had an actual function of prayer and fasting on the behalf of the community. St. Paul talks about them as um, widows, as women who do not have any other form of support. So they're actually salaried by the church. And... Um, they were to function then as part of the um, the staff, in a sense, of the church, taking care of the church's spiritual as well as its um, social and pastoral needs. And then in the Testamentum Domini, consistent with the other kinds of um, ways in which it showed these consecrated widows to be similar to male deacons, or, or similar, I'm sorry, to female deacons, they also assisted in baptism and at the liturgy in the Testamentum Domini in a way that you see um, done by the deaconesses in other communities. Now, the Grapte, these are an order of women who are um, associated with this male monastery, the Pandocrator, that was founded by the emperor and his wife in Constantinople in the 12th century. This monastery, as did many monasteries in urban areas, had um, double functions. It was a monastic community, and it, it dealt with its own spiritual needs, but it also had an outreach 
to the broader community, to the lay community in the area. And part of that was to have a Friday night, a weekly Friday night vigil. And so for that vigil to which, which was part of the, um, the workings of the outer of the three churches of this monastery. There were actually three churches and one of them was on the very edge of the monastery. <coughs> Excuse me. And so this um, particular church then could be opened to the public. And that's where they would do the vigil. In order to serve the needs of the community at large, the monastery, the Pandokrator, had this group of women. There were four of them. Um, they are described as enlisted with the clergy, um, but in the numbered count of the clergy, they're not numbered with them. So they seem to be in a liminal position, sort of an in-between position, and, and that's why I list them among the consecrated um, groups of women. There is discussion, again, of, of what... Um, what type of women should be given this role? There were four of them. They needed to be respectable. They needed to be mature in age and character. And really the way that they're described in the Tipicon of the Pandokrator Monastery is very similar to the way that we see the widows described in the material of almost um, a millennium earlier. In terms of their functions at the monastery then, it was mostly connected to this um, weekly public vigil, all four of these grapte actually helped to organize the procession and to deal with the needs of the public, particularly of the women um, faithful who participated in that vigil, who attended that. But the, but two of them, they would uh, rotate, two of them helped to oversee that church that was open to the public on a weekly basis throughout the whole week and, and to deal with whatever um, laity might come into the parish there. Now, the myrrh-bearers are a very interesting group. Um, we have evidence of them from um, an F. Koloyon, a, a prayer book, an order book, um, from the Church of Jerusalem. Uh, it's in a 12th century manuscript that is a copy of an earlier manuscript that dates to at least the 9th century. And so I've posited that this order began sometime between the 5th and the 9th century. The reason I've said that is because um, we have a pretty elaborate account of the, um, of the Paschal services in the diary of uh, the nun Nigeria, the Spanish nun Nigeria that's from the 4th century, and she does not describe these women. So my guess is that it's sometime between, um, in, in this middle period, that this order of myrrh bearers, Mirofori, um, began. They have, obviously, they needed to have existed until at least the 12th century, or else they, they wouldn't have continued to be mentioned um, in the manuscript. They have an important role to play in um, the Easter services of the Church of Jerusalem. And I should mention that these are not deaconesses. Uh, female deacons are also mentioned in the rubrics for in this mon in this manuscript. So this is another order of women in addition to female deacons in the Church of Jerusalem. Um, they chanted and prepared the Holy Sepulcher with the patriarch, the archdeacon, and the chants um, and the, the chanters. They cleaned it, um, they got it um, ready, they chanted some of the services, um, the hours, etc that were um, done in preparation for the great Paschal services. They participated in the liturgy of St. James that was also done at that time. And particularly for the service um, for Easter itself, they had a very important role to play where they, they both chanted and they actually sensed the patriarch while the patriarch was at the tomb and when he read the gospel, um, these myrrh bearers would, would sense the patriarch. So they were basically following the kinds of, um, functions that the original myrrh bearers did, you know, anointing um, Christ, preparing the tomb, etc., going to, to visit the tomb. So you see this liturgical 
women's order um, following that kind of function. And it fits, of course, for the Church of Jerusalem, which in general tried to follow much of the um, the gospel um, description of the events connected to Christ's cru- crucifixion and resurrection. And they also carried um, the Triskelio, and that's a, a three um three-legged uh, stand, reading stand, uh, in procession during the matins. And you see the description of what each um, group is carrying, and in that um, procession you also have female deacons as well as male deacons. There are two of each order, male, male female, um, merbears, etc., Unfortunately, we don't know anything else about these women. <laughs> it's, it's rather surprising that we don't have more information about them. What we have the most information about, actually, are ordained female deacons. Um, we first see deacons, female deacons, mentioned, actually, in the New Testament. Um, the, uh, the Apostle Paul mentions Phoebe, um, in Romans 16, verse 1, and he describes her as a viaconos. It's interesting to trace the kinds of assumptions that scholars at various times make, because earlier English translations used to translate viaconos in the generic sense as servant. And now if you look at the translations over the past 20 years or so, you see that it's translated as deacon. Now one of the things that's interesting about this is that if you read Origen or Chrysostom in their exegesis of Romans, they both assume that Phoebe is a female deacon. And yet later on, the translators um, on the, of the King James Um, Bible and of later English translations thought, well, that couldn't possibly be the case. And so they, they made it a generic translation into servant instead. But now we see it returning. It's also interesting to see that in addition to Origen and Chrysostom, we have a number of epigrams, um, funerary steles that, um, are in honor of other female deacons. And several of them actually mention Phoebe, that, you know, this this deaconess, this female deacon, is another Phoebe, for instance. Um, another area of evidence that we have are these early church orders that are predominantly from the 3rd and 4th centuries. Um, those are the names of them. For some of you may be familiar with them. Most of you probably not. Um, the Vidascalia Apostolorum is the earliest of those. It dates from the mid to late third century and is the basis actually for the apostolic constitutions. Both of these documents are believed to come from the area of, of Antioch, from around the Church of Antioch. And then the Testamentum Domini, which um, many scholars also believe came originally from that church, later um, the Church of Caesarea, around Caesarea, um, in Cappadocia, it actually is um, extant only in um, an Ethiopic uh, translation, I believe. Then we have various saints' lives, legislation, canons, seals, epigrams. There's a lot of additional discussion of female deacons in passing. And one of the things that's very interesting here is that, again, the word diakonos is used, not diakonisa. Occasionally you do see diakonisa in these church orders or in the legislation or canons, but the much more common term used is diakonos, which is exactly the same word that's used for a male deacon. This is significant because, of course, we have other um, women, um, presbytera, episcopa, these are the wives of presbyters and of bishops, um, but there's no confusion here by using the masculine ending, the second declension ending, for those of you who know Greek, um, you can see that it's clearly the same order. In fact, the Emperor Justinian did a lot of legislation um, dealing with the clergy in the great church um, of the Holy Wisdom of Hagia Sophia in Constantinople as well as the Church of Blacherne. And he, in one of his uh, canons, in one of his novels, excuse me, his laws, he actually talks about the Ierosini, the priesthood in the broad sense. 
and includes in that discussion of who are the Ierosini, bishops, presbyters, who we normally call priests, deacons, and at both male and female, in other words, deacons and, and deaconesses. So they're actually included as part of the Ierosini, those major orders, the higher clergy. Um, and then you, you see it in various other things. Saints' lives will occasionally mention someone as a deaconess, as a female deacon. Uh, for instance, it's interesting, the life of Macrina, although the church mentions her as a deaconess in um, the Synaxadion, actually there's really no indication that she was a deaconess. However, um, her brother, St. Gregory of Nyssa, mentions one of the other nuns in the monastery, as being a female deacon. She's the head of the chanters, the women who chanted in the monastery. Um, seals, there's actually a seal from um, southern Italy, from Byzantine Italy, probably Calabria. And um, earlier scholar Schlumberger, when he, in the late 19th, early 20th century, first published this, this seal, uh, personal seal, he corrected it um, from a feminine name, Antonina, to a masculine name, Antony, because he just assumed, since the word diakonos was there, that surely it wasn't a woman. <laughs> and even more recently, in a prosopography that's been published, um, the editor of that prosopography, um, George Martindale, mentions that maybe it really was a female deaconess, but, but still lists it under the masculine form. So you still see scholars unwilling to deal with what's actually right before their eyes um, because of their assumptions and biases. Um, then finally, you have actual um, Efkoloya, the service books. And we have in those service books the right of ordination of female deacons. We have it from the earliest Byzantine Efkoloyon, which is in existence today. That's the Barberini 336 Codex, which dates to the 8th century. The full rite is there. It is virtually identical to the male rite. I'm going to talk about it a little more um, in a minute. But there, but it also exists in other manuscripts, um, dating into, um, the 12th century, um, or so. And one of the things that's interesting is that these Efkoloya don't always list the ordination rites in the same order. So some of them start with the bishop and then go down, you know, presbyter, deacon, um, female deacon, um, subdeacon, reader, etc. Others go in an ascending order, start with the lower orders and then move their way up to the episcopacy. What's interesting, what to me shows that the early and Byzantine church clearly understood the female deacon to be the same as the male deacon um, in terms of ordination, is that the female deacon's ordination rite is always listed immediately after the male deacon's rite, regardless of whether it's an ascending or descending order. Obviously, if it were considered to be a separate order, then in the ascending type of organization, she would be listed first. Her ordination right would be listed before the male deacons, but that's not the case. In fact, um, at least one of the manuscripts doesn't even bother to give a separate right. It just has a notation after the deacons, the male deacons, saying for female, same thing except for, and there's two or three little differences that are listed. Um, so I think you can see just how um, how they did understand female deacons to have been an ordained order um, equal to the male diaconate. Now, I say that apparently they seem to have been related to the widows because when you look at the eligibility requirements, they are the same as those for the widows, at least initially. Early on, female deacons had to be at least 60 years of age. Later, by the 4th century, the um, age requirement is lowered to 40. Um, now, I should mention that even then, there are exceptions to this. One of the, excuse me, one of the best-known female deacons is the deaconess Olympias, who was a very good friend of St. John Chrysostom and patron of his in Constantinople. In fact, it was her icon that I had on the um, initial screen there. 
She was ordained at apparently the age of 29. She had been widowed at a young age. She refused to remarry, although the emperor tried desperately to because she was extremely wealthy and he wanted to marry her off to one of his relatives. Um, but she refused, and um, after showing that she was willing to do anything, including lose her entire fortune in order to remain celibate um, and to enter monastic orders, the emperor finally gave in, and um, she was a friend of both um, St. Gregory the Theologian, Gregory of Nazianzus, when he was Archbishop of Constantinople, and then later of St. John Chrysostom as well, and she was ordained at a very young age. Um, now, one of the things that happens over time is that who is getting ordained seems to change. Early on, we see that deaconesses, female deacons, are serving in parishes. They're serving, you know, the broader community. Later, it seems to become basically something within monastic orders. And so you see an abbess, for instance, such as uh, St. Irene Chrysavalonton um, being ordained. This is in the ninth century. Or um, you'll see... Um, Bishop's wives being ordained. One of the um, canons from the council in Trullo, this was held in 691 and 692, um, one of those canons requires that if, um, if a man is elected to the episcopacy and he is married, he must separate from his wife. Um, so this is when you see finally it's that, that uh, celibacy at the level of the bishop is is being enforced. There, there was an expectation from a couple of centuries earlier, um, but that expectation wasn't anything that was regulated, and some bishops made it quite clear that they did not plan to put their wives away, and they planned to have a nice big family such as um, Synesius of Cyrene. But at the, this council in Trullo in 691, 692, they do make it a requirement that the bishop um, separate from his wife. And it says in the canon that if she's found worthy, she's to be ordained as a female deacon and um, and in any case to um, to enter a monastery. Now, female deacons had a variety of functions um, depending on time and place. Um, it's interesting that we don't have a lot of indication of them chanting, but I have a feeling that they must have chanted much more than we know about because the one uh, uh, example that I know of is actually from a Russian traveler. He calls them myrrh-bearers, by the way, because he was unfamiliar with um, women in an ordained role, but where he describes them as being located is where, in fact, the female deacons were located up at the front of the left side um, of, um, of Hagia Sophia, and he's writing about this in the 12th century, and he just mentions that um, these women are chanting the matin service. Um, we find from early on that it was important for them to um, be a chaperone at any meetings, any appointments that female um, faithful might have, a woman in the community might have with any of the male clergy, whether that be a, a male deacon, a, a presbyter, or the bishop. Um, this is something that might not be such a bad idea today. <laughs> it certainly prevents the he said, she said thing. We have this, I think, um, unrealistic view that the early church was some sort of golden age and everything worked well and people were all wonderful. Um, and people were people in the third century <laughs> and fourth century just as they are today. And so you had people that took advantage of others. Um, and so you had this, um, this role for the female deacon that she actually made sure that there was no um, impropriety um, in any meeting of a female person with a male clergyman. Um, they also kept order in the women's section of the church. As I mentioned before, you had men and women segregated in church. Um, some of you who have more contact with the, uh, the old country may still be aware of that. 
um, in some of the European uh, churches, and maybe even in some here in the United States. I don't know whether there are very many that do this anymore. Typically, you'll find the men on the south side of the church, the women on the north or left side of the church. Um, so you find that the female deacons are given among their functions being um, the... the um, the gatekeepers, um, so to speak, so the doorkeepers of the women's side, so they serve a variety of functions over on that side of the church. You also see that consistent with this idea of um, both ministering to women and having a more private liturgical function, that they take the Eucharist to women in their homes. In other words, if a woman is sick or after childbirth or something, the female deacon takes uh, the Eucharist to women in their homes. It needed to be somebody who was ordained. Um, in the very early church, there's indications that the faithful at large would take some of the Eucharist home with them after the Sunday liturgy, but that died out pretty quickly because um, there was concern about it not being properly cared for. So only ordained clergy could handle the Eucharist. Um, therefore, it was male deacons who would take the Eucharist to sick men and female deacons who would take the Eucharist to sick women. That was part of their pastoral function. Um, they would also <coughs> excuse me, help to teach the faith to women converts to the faith, and they had a very important role to play with respect to the baptism of adult women. Um, today, most of us are only familiar um, in certain Orthodox and Eastern churches with uh, infants being baptized in the nude, but in the early church, everybody was. And it didn't matter how old you were. And so it was part of the um, the symbolism that this was truly a complete death and rebirth. And as you come into the world, you know, as a new baby, this is how you came out of the water at baptism. Um, needless to say, it wasn't really considered acceptable for a middle-aged male bishop to rub the oil of baptism, oil of gladness all over some 20-year-old female's body and dip her into the water. So you actually had a female deacon who took care of the physical baptism of these women converts, and then um, they would robe them, or in one case, I think it's in the Testamentum Domini, there's actually... Um, a, a kind of uh, screen or, or curtain with a, a hole in it that the bishop puts his hand through so that he can place his hand on top of um, the female convert and read the, the prayer of baptism over her. So um, you find, too, because of this, there are some very strong injunctions about how deaconesses cannot baptize. And you can see why this would happen. Both female deacons and male deacons assisted at baptisms. But with the male deacon, the bishop was there. So there was no confusion as to who was the actual celebrant of the sacrament of baptism. It was clearly the bishop. With the female converts, however, with female baptisms, um, it was actually the deaconess who was doing the baptism itself, and then the bishop would read the prayers afterwards. So I, it, it appears that some people thought that they could just go to a deaconess and get baptized by her without um, the bishops being involved. So you see in the apostolic constitutions, for instance, that that's an important um, caution that they make. Now, I mentioned before that I wanted to talk about the ordination rite of the female deacon, and it's it's important to bring this out because there is still a little bit of debate, um, not by any of your top scholars, um, but um, by a few. There's there's still a little debate as to whether this ordination is, would be classified as what we today call the major orders, that is, deacon, um, presbyter, and bishop. Ordinations to the major orders occurs at the altar. Ordinations to minor orders, for instance, the tonsuring of a reader, occurs outside of the altar area. Normally you would see that happening on the solea. The other major difference is when it occurs. 
So for the major orders, you see it occurring during the divine liturgy. Where it occurs during the divine liturgy depends on what order you're talking about. Um, with deacons, it will be relatively late in the liturgy so that it's um, shortly before um, the, the Eucharist is distributed um, to the faithful. However, with the presbyter, the priest, it'll be before the consecration so that the newly ordained priest can, can actually um, celebrate the consecration. What you see with respect to the ordination of the female deacon is that it occurs during the liturgy, just as it does with the male deacon, and in fact at exactly the same point in the liturgy as it does for the male deacon. With that is immediately following the section called the anaphora, or the offering, um, the central portion of the liturgy. Also, in terms of where it occurs, it occurs at the same place, at the altar, with the bishop laying on hands on the, the woman being ordained to the diaconate and reading two prayers. This is another difference. Uh, minor orders generally have just one prayer read for them. The major orders, there are two prayers, and there are two prayers in the case of the female deacon. The female deacon also is vested with the orarion. This is that long stole that you see the deacons wear. Um, now, one of the differences that you do see between male and female deacons is the way in which the bishop um, vests the female deacon with the orarion. With the male deacon, it's over the one shoulder. With the female deacon, it's, she's vested as with um, the subdeacon. In other words, it's crossed around and the back comes over both shoulders. Now, I believe that this is functional, that this difference is functional in nature. The male deacon um, will read petitions, will go out and read petitions, and so he will hold up the end of the orarion. And then later, when he's getting ready to receive the Eucharist, he will, in fact, turn around his orarion and wear it the same way as the subdeacon and the female deacon. The female deacon, by contrast, will not be doing... Um, these these litanies will not be will not be reciting these petitions in church, and therefore there's no reason for her to wear it that way. She's immediately vested with the orarion in the way in which she will re wear it when receiving the Eucharist, um, and that again goes to one of those differences I mentioned at the beginning: this public versus private. So you see, the female deacon has she's ordained she's ordained in virtually the same way as the male deacon but she doesn't have all the same public functions that the male deacon does and that fit that society that byzantine society where women really had no public functions whatsoever um and then finally you see the female deacon <coughs> excuse me she receives the Eucharist from the bishop at the altar. This is a very important distinction as well. The lower orders of clergy, uh, subdeacons, readers, etc., they did not, nor do they today, receive the Eucharist at the altar. They receive it with the laity. Um, however, the female deacon at her ordination receives the Eucharist at the altar, she's at the end of the line behind the male deacons, and she receives the chalice, actually, from the bishop and replaces it herself on the altar. And again, this is a slight difference from the male deacon, because when the male deacon receives the chalice, then he will turn and take it outside to give to distribute the Eucharist to the faithful during the service. But she doesn't have that public function. So she simply replaces it on the altar, and then the male clergy will actually um, take it to the, the, um, to the faithful. I thought you might enjoy seeing one of the prayers, um, ordination prayers for the female deacon, because it really shows um, both how it's a, a ministry for women and yet at the same time shows that it's truly an ordained order. Holy and almighty God, who through the birth of your only begotten Son and our God from the Virgin, according to the flesh, sanctified the female, and not to men alone, but also to women, bestowed grace and the advent of your Holy Spirit. Now, Lord, look upon this your servant and call her to the work of your diaconate, and send down upon her the abundant gift of your Holy Spirit, 
Keep her in orthodox faith, in blameless conduct, always fulfilling her ministry according to your pleasure, because to you is due all glory and honor and worship, etc. Um, and so you can see how it's a real descent of the Holy Spirit, the laying on of hands. It is a true prayer of ordination. So, to sum up this material, if you look at um, the various types of liturgical roles that women played in early Christianity and particularly in the Byzantine period, you see that they fill a variety of types. So you have unofficial, non-ordained roles such as those processional incense bearers, something that just happens perhaps spontaneously in a certain location at a certain time, um, giving honor to women who have played an important role in the church and therefore are recognized liturgically. Then you have consecrated roles. These are women who are not ordained per se, and yet they are officially consecrated. They have particular ministries to play within the church, nuns and virgins, widows in the early church, the Grapte in the uh, monastery of the Pandocrator, the Almighty in Constantinople. And so these women also have important liturgical functions, but not the same kind of central functions as the ordained clergy. And then finally, you see actual, what I believe are ordained orders in terms of the Merbears of Jerusalem. I, I guess I forgot to mention earlier. Um, I believe that because of the centrality of the kinds of liturgical functions that these Merbears had in the Church of Jerusalem, they probably were ordained. It's inconceivable to me that, for instance, they participated in the procession. They are, I think, ahead of the subdeacons um, in the procession. It's, it's, it's inconceivable that these women would not have been ordained, um, given the kinds of liturgical functions that they played um, in the Church of Jerusalem. And certainly we do have the ordination rites in a variety of manuscripts for um, female deacons. Unfortunately, um, they, they die out. All these various roles died out over time. Obviously, we still have nuns today, um, but many of these other ministries, particularly the ones that were geared more toward um, parish pastoral ministry and liturgical ministry, have unfortunately um, fallen into disuse over time. Um, there have been some attempts to um, resurrect them. We're not even sure why they died out uh, specifically. My suspicion is that female deacons um, died out because of the rise of this notion of ritual impurity that develops in the Byzantine church from about the 8th or 9th century on because we find a couple of um, canonists in uh, the late 12th century and later, Theodore Balsam, and for instance, um, and Matthew Vlastadis from the 14th century, who find it inconceivable. They, they, they've got the evidence. They know the material. So they recognize that there were these female deacons and yet, and that they were ordained at the altar. And yet, you see in their writing, they're like, but they couldn't have been because women aren't allowed into the altar because by their time period, that had become the practice that women could not be in the altar, and yet obviously they were at an earlier time period, and they're just unfamiliar um, with the full extent of that evidence. So that seems to be part of what's going on there. But you do have um, various attempts to revive um, female deacons. Um, in fact, um, if, if you go to the next uh, slide, here is a photograph of an Armenian um, deaconess, a female deacon in the Armenian Apostolic Church, the non-Chalcedonian Church. And you see, this is part of a revival that began in the 19th century and went until just about 20 years ago. Apparently no new female deacons have been ordained in the last couple of decades um, by the current Catholic cause, both of them. Um, but, um, but in this case, they're vested identically to the male deacon, except that they also have the headdress. When you read um, the ordination rite in, for the Byzantine um, deacon, um, she actually wears the maforion. This is a, a long um, a veil type of garment that covers her head and comes down onto her shoulders. In fact, most icons of the Theotokos show her wearing the maforion. And so the, the orarion was put on 
underneath that. But here you see um, the, the modern Armenian female deacon being vested the same way as the male deacon and also holding the liturgical fan. And her liturgical functions became identical to the male deacons in the modern era. We also have an example with um, in the Greek Orthodox Church with uh, St. Nectarios of Aegina, who died in the 1920s. He ordained several women in the women's monastery that he founded um, on Aegina. He ordained them to the female diaconate and did so um, in order that they could have a fuller liturgy of the hours so they could do the petitions, etc., when there was no priest there. So he had them doing functions, liturgical functions, which in the Byzantine period they had not done. Um, it's interesting to, to look at his correspondence with the Archbishop of Athens. He tried to downplay it and say, well, they're, they're not really ordained as deacons. They're more like um, subdeacons or readers, or and I think he was just trying to keep um, from having a, too much of a, um, a brouhaha on his hands. But it's very clear that they he used the old ordination service that he ordained them as female deacons, and in fact gave them broader liturgical functions than they had had um, in the Byzantine period. Um, most recently, within the past year, the um, synod of bishops, the holy synod of the Church of Greece has voted to restore the ordained female diaconate. Now, there are consecrated but not ordained female deacons in um, the non-Chalcedonian uh, Coptic Church, the Church of Alexandria, but this would be in the Church of Greece now. The decision has been made to restore the fully ordained um, female diaconate. I think they too, like um, like St. Nectarios, are somewhat concerned about negative backlash, so they want to start it in some remote women's monasteries. Um, but at least one of the bishops on the synod was very vocal in saying, we don't need them in the monasteries, we need them in the parishes. <laughs> um, so we'll see what happens over the next few years. Thank you. I'd be happy to answer any questions that you might have. Thank you very much, Dr. Karras, for an enlightening, uh, stimulating, exciting uh, presentation. And we look forward to the questions that are coming. Dr. Karras will respond to questions now for a while. So if anyone would like to raise a question, please do so. And Dr. Karras will repeat the question so that the the recording will pick it up and the questions will be recorded. Yes, uh, he asked about um, the disappearance of the female diaconate, whether it may have been linked to um, the decline in the number of adult female converts as the empire became Christianized. And then um, with the emergence of more and more um, adult converts in the modern era, era, particularly here in the United States, whether um, that might introduce a, a renewed need for um, for the female diaconate. I think that could have played the, the question of adult converts, the decline in adult female converts. I think it could have played a role, but it doesn't answer it completely because by about the 6th or 7th century, you really don't have very many adult baptisms, but you still have female deacons. For instance, Irene Chrysavalanton, her vita mentions the um, Patriarch of Constantinople ordaining her to the female diaconate, and this is in the ninth century. Um, so there certainly wasn't a big need for female um, uh, for for deacons t um, to baptize female converts in Constantinople in the ninth century. <coughs> of course, there were still other liturgical needs, um, taking communion to sick women, um, doing other pastoral ministry uh, to the women in the community. The chaperoning function, I think, never goes out of style. <laughs> uh, <laughs> But but certainly it does raise an issue today. I think part of it is it would be part of a broader issue, which is um, do we want to return to having nude baptisms for adults? Uh, we don't have that today. 
Um, at least I don't know any church that does it. Normally, um, adult, uh, adults being baptized will wear a robe or um, perhaps a bathing suit, something like that. Um, I'd actually kind of like to see the return. I mean, I love the symbolism of it. It, it seems so odd for us. We're, I think we, we live in a very puritanical society, um, and so we're, we're very uncomfortable with that sort of thing, unfortunately. I do think, actually, that in terms of the female diaconate today, I kind of agree with that, um, that bishop in Greece that I would not want to see the role restricted the way it was in Byzantine times. I think it fit for the Byzantine period where um, men and women had very different functions. Um, but following that same mentality that that the functions of male and female deacons mirrored the functions of men and women in society at large. Today, where men and women largely do the same functions in society, I would like to see a, an ordained female diaconate have the same liturgical and pastoral functions as the male diaconate. In other words, just both men and women being ordained and serving the church in that way. With respect to the female diaconate, there's, there's a fair amount of material. Um, there are multiple um, ordination rites. Um, it's mentioned in a number of church orders. Um, it's mentioned um, female deacons are mentioned in a number of saints' lives. There are little bits and pieces all over the place um, of, to give evidence to the female diaconate and to the functions that they had. With some of these others, however, there's very little. Two of those uh, things, well, actually three that I mentioned, there's really only one thing, those processional incense bearers. It's just from this fresco of this monastery church showing um, the the weekly um, procession um, with the um, the icon of the Theotokos, the Odihitria, um from Constantinople, with the Grapte of uh, the Pandokrator. Scholars were, were all puzzled. We, we have never even seen that term um, before, Grapte. Uh, and so we, and, and yet it's used in the Tipikon of this monastery. It's not defined, so apparently... Others knew of this, that it was probably not the only such example of women with this kind of consecrated function. The myrrh bearers is the third one, where we have no other um, ex documentation for it that has survived, at least that I know of. Um, so, yeah, you have to do a lot of digging and and piece things together from here and there um, to form a fuller picture. And the fact that we have just these little bits and pieces, but that seem to indicate more, makes us makes me at any rate wonder just how much do we not know about? How much has fallen through the cracks over the centuries? It's, there's just no way of knowing. I was asked what it would take to restore the female diaconate today. Really, just a bishop that has the guts to ordain one. I mean, the, you know, seriously. You know. <laughs> you know, the fact of the matter is that it was an ordained order of the church for almost three quarters of its history that we have the ordination right in a variety of ephroloia, that we have examples as recently as Saint Nectarios, who, a saint no less, who just went ahead and did it. So really that's all it would take. On a practical level, you would probably want something like what the bishop, the synod of bishops in the Church of Greece has done. In other words, to have a whole synod of bishops decide on this mutually to do it. I think politically it, it's going to need to be a grassroots movement. I, I really think that the people have to say, look, we need this. We need more clergy in our parishes. We need women clergy as well as men. And, you know, there's, we've got it. It's, it's an historical order of the church. There's no reason not to restore it. While not being necessarily limited to what its historical role was. For I was asked whether, um, I've seen, uh, evidence of a blessing for, uh, women to be readers and cantors. I haven't seen that. Um, although it's interesting that I have seen, 
not only female deacons, but evidence of, of nuns, for instance, serving as chanters. For instance, that, that example with the, the church in Thessaloniki with St. Demetrius, that women were doing this. So it's unclear whether they were being tonsured as readers or chanters, or whether just by virtue of the order that they were in, that they had that function. Um, one of the things that I've been realizing is that because I see these women doing these things, that I don't see the formal ordination or consecration right for. Either there was consecration going on, for instance, with the myrrh bearers, um, or the church didn't consider it necessary to do that, um, perhaps for either men or women. Um, but my guess is that um, they may, in fact, have been consecrated, but there just was no separate um, description of that provided. Um, I was asked about the, the, the fact that there were no Slavic sources that I mentioned. Um, there's a couple of reasons for that, I think. One is that most of the material I'm looking at is before the Slavs have been Christianized, because, of course, the Christianization begins in the ninth century uh, with Cyril and Methodius. Um, the, other, the other is that, as far as I know, and I don't read the Slavic languages, so I, I may be missing something, but I have relied on um, what a colleague of mine, George Majeska, from University of Maryland, um, told me, which is that he's never seen any evidence of um, female deacons in um, in the Slavic churches, he said that this term myrrh bearers would be used for women who did informal um, liturgical and pastoral functions in the church. And, and in fact, he thought that's why Anthony of Novgorod at the end of the, around 1200, so the end of the 12th century, turn of the 13th century, why he described the female deacons as you know, um, as myrrh bearers. Um, so it may be that it just, because by the ninth century, my guess is that the female diaconate was already in decline in the Byzantine church. It may be that it just never got itself established in the Slavic churches. Okay, I was asked about um, whether there's a changing role of women in society that, that might correlate to the rise uh, in, in the Byzantine period from the 5th to 12th century that might correlate to the um, rise in this idea of ritual impurity. I'm not sure that there is. I, I, I don't think that there actually is a change in, um, in, in the society per se, um, but I do think that um, there is more of this Judaizing that comes in um, over time, and that that includes this Levitical idea of ritual impurity. And I should mention, and and it's good that you point out the, this question about it for women per se, because it's not consistent. Balsamin and Vla studies, Matthew Vla studies, um, both are are quite happy to say that we're Christians. We're not under the Levitical law when it comes um, to the question of male ejaculants receiving the Eucharist. But women who are menstruating are a different story for them. <laughs> so now part of that may just be because, excuse me, <clears throat> part of that may be because they're interpreting Dionysius of Alexandria who's doing that. So they may feel constrained to follow along the same lines. Um, but it's unclear whether there really is a difference in how women are viewed overall in that middle to later Byzantine period from in the early um, period or late antiquity. It, in fact, it's kind of interesting to me that um, Theodore Balsaman complains about how women aren't really following this rule or what he thinks is a rule the way that they're supposed to be because they're still kind of going to church. They're in the narthex. Um, he complains about nuns um, going to church. With, and I keep wondering how he knows that these women are menstruating. Um, <laughs> <laughs> But he's got, but the fact that he's complaining about how all these women are not actually following this makes me think that it's not really a rule as much as he wants to think that it is. However, I do think that that notion is um, coming into play more. Um, and I think that part of it is because 
the church is no longer in a situation where it sees itself in competition with and needing to distinguish itself from Judaism. Um, so it may feel more comfortable in taking on parts of, um, of uh, Levitical law. There is some evidence of, um, there are certainly women who are called deacons. There's a rite of ordination. Um, a, a scholar named Gary Macy has done some work on this, has published on this in theological studies and other journals. Um, but what he's shown so far seems to be that for the most part in the Western church, um, they're either consecrated but not ordained, or else it's an adjunct role to their husbands. So he has evidence into the medieval period, actually, of women being consecrated or ordained alongside their husbands, which is rather interesting. But I haven't seen him um, describe any evidence of a fully ordained female diaconate that is its own order, you know, where these women are independent of... Um, of, of their husbands as in the Byzantine church. Now, southern Italy and Sicily is a different story below Rome because this was Byzantine, it was Greek-speaking, and in fact, the seal that I mentioned earlier that uh, Schlumberger had um, mistakenly corrected to um, a man's name, that was, um, that was from Greek-speaking Italy in the 8th century. Oh, that's a good question. I actually am completely unaware of how other Orthodox churches um, or the or the uh, the Vatican, the Catholic Church, have responded to the decision of the Synod of Bishops in in Greece to ordain women to um, the female diaconate. Um, the decision was made. I think it's been about a year ago now. So there may have been some response, but. Nobody's talked to me about it. Um, I, maybe I need to look into that. My guess is that most of them are just going to kind of ignore it and, and hope that it, you know, doesn't actually come to pass. Because I, my guess is also that if it does come to pass, as I hope that it will, that it will put more pressure on these other churches. <laughs> Let me recap for... Um, let me recap for those of you who may not have, have heard. Um, Metropolitan Nicholas mentioned that uh, um, that the synod, uh, the scope, or well, actually not synod per se, but the scope of bishops um, heard about the uh, decision to ordain uh, female deacons in the Church of Greece and and just heard it and let it go at that. <laughs> um, and he mentioned that. There's the question of um, vocations in general, of vocations to um, to the priesthood, to um, the monastic orders, etc., and that a number of women, um, both um, nuns, consecrated widows, and others, are serving a variety of pastoral and some um, auxiliary liturgical functions. Um, I would say that the evidence is incontrovertible. So women were ordained as female deacons. They were the equal of male deacons with somewhat more limited functions that reflected their more limited roles in society. That's, that's the history. There's, you know, people can have different opinions about whether they think we should have female deacons today, you can't have different opinions about the facts. That's something that I see in politics a lot today. I don't want to see that entering into our church. I think we need to be very clear about what the actual history was, um, even when it's uncomfortable um, for us. And I would say that in reverse as well. There is no good evidence that women were ordained to the priesthood or episcopacy um, in the early church. Um, that doesn't mean I don't think that women should be ordained, um, should not be ordained to it. I'm just saying that the historical evidence does not support that. And so the ordination of women to the priesthood is a very different issue than the ordination of women to the diaconate, both because the one is an historical fact, whereas the other is not, and because they are very different orders. Um, and the diaconate is not equivalent to the priesthood, and so I think they need to be dealt with as, as two very distinct issues. But I will disagree with you, 
Your Grace, there is, there is indeed a clamoring. You may not have heard it, but I have, um, for women uh, to, to serve in this role and to serve liturgical and pastoral functions um, on a full-time ordained basis. So um, I, I do agree with you that we have a broader issue of vocations, of needing to encourage um, and nurture vocations, and I would not want to see the female diaconate seen as something off by itself. I think it needs to be part of a much expanded um, and developed diaconate period for our church today. We have a desperate need for those kinds of social ministry and pastoral functions, which our early church was so well aware of and provided for, and which today um, we're only just beginning to rediscover the need for, I think. Thank you once again, Dr. Karras, for your wonderful lecture for the additional enlightening responses that I think will stimulate a lot of discussion during the reception. 